Good morning, everyone. Um, this is Natalie Battles. I'm the Executive Director for AISHA, and I wanted to welcome everyone to the 2022 Student Advocacy Day and AISHA Lobby Day. Um, we appreciate everyone joining us this morning. We're excited to have you with us. Uh, we wish we could be up at the beautiful Iowa Capitol this year. Um, it's a gorgeous day out and it would have been really fun to tour and do all those things, but uh, we'll do one more year of virtual and then hope to see everybody back in person next year. So just a couple things I wanted to review this morning before we get started. Um, we've got a great agenda planned for you with Aisha leaders um, talking about the issues that are important to um, SLPs and audiologists in Iowa and the advocacy process. And then we'll hear from our lobbyist, Kate Walton, who's joining us a little later to talk about the advocacy process in Iowa. And then we're really excited to be hosting one of Iowa's legislative leaders, Senator Chris Knoyer today. So hopefully you have lots of questions for Senator Knoyer and we'll look forward to visiting with her later. A couple of housekeeping items before we get started. Please make sure to keep your line muted during the presentation. We would like this to be interactive. So go ahead and raise your hand or use the raise your hand function and the chat function if you have, have questions as those come up during the presentations. Um, we'd love to hear from you. And then some of you uh, joining us today are um, did sign up for the ASHA CE that is available for this course. If you did register or maybe registered a little bit late, please double check and make sure that we have your ASHA ID number if you wanna receive CE credit. So in order to do that, you can just go back to your registration confirmation, um, go back and double check that, make sure it's selected and that we have your ASHA ID number so that we can submit that um, at the end of today's session. One other um, item to mention, I see a lot of names on the screen. So if you are joining us by phone, um, just make sure that we have your contact information or your name somewhere on. We will track the CE by the Zoom recording um, reports. So with that, I'm gonna go ahead and turn things over to Sarah Cheney, our Vice President of Go Government Colleges and Universities to kick us off this morning. Good morning, everyone. Um, like she said, I am Sarah Cheney, the Vice President for Government Colleges and Universities. Full warning, I am in a school building right now. So if you hear something, I'll try to be very conscious of that. Um, but I am excited to once again be hosting Advocacy Day. Um, like Natalie said again, I really wish it was up at the Capitol, but we will do with what we have. Let Hi, Rachel, are you able to, um, is your audio working? Uh, yes, it is, I think. Okay. okay. Um, what I might do then is go ahead and share Sarah's slides for a minute while we get started. Or Rachel, would you want to just maybe flip flop and go ahead and run through your slides while we wait for Sarah to get reconnected? Yeah, I'll go first. No okay. problem. That would be great. Thanks so much, Rachel. You're welcome. Okay, um, it is, oh, there we go. Can everyone see my slides? They look great and we can hear Perfect. you great, so. Perfect. So I am the president of Aisha, and a large part of what my job is, is to talk about advocacy 
for the professions of audiology and speech language pathology. And often when we think about advocacy, it, it's a word people use a lot, but maybe we're talking about it in different ways. And so I wanted us to kind of think about what does advocacy mean, both for the state association, but also when we're talking about advocacy for a profession. When we think about advocacy, it's really used to educate, inform, and persuade. And when we keep, when we keep these three ideas in mind, we can talk about different ways to advocate. Education is very important, not only for the families, um, the children, the adults that we serve, but also for the public as a whole. So when we're talking about something like a legislative agenda, really what we're thinking about is how do we get people the help that they need to be able to be successful and to communicate. And so a lot of the bills that we're working on and that Sarah will talk about really are a piece of this um, getting people things like the hearing aids that they need, uh, making sure that parents have options and opportunities to pick the treatments that work best for their children. But we have to start with that education because if people don't know what speech language pathologists are or audiologists are, they don't necessarily listen, right? So it's really important that they know who we are as practitioners. So part of advocacy of Aisha is we're supporting audiologists and speech language pathologists. We're thinking about public policy. We're thinking about political action and we're thinking about popular opinion. So public policy would be things like um, the kinds of decisions our licensure board makes, right? Whether we're going to allow online continuing education or whether it has to be in person. Um, some of that public policy is about supporting things that other organizations bring forward that might be really good for our clients as well. So things like telehealth. Public policy may also be things that we think are really important for our clients, our families, and our profession that we, we introduce at the, at the legislative level. When we're thinking about political action, um, political action is that writing letters having conversations, meeting with people, going to legislative forums, any of those things would fall into the political action kind of category. And then we have the final one, popular opinion. Do people know about us? Do they know what our jobs entail? And do they know how we help and really play a critical role in making sure that all Iowans, all people have access to communication? Now, today we have um, a very specific kind of advocacy we're talking about, and that's legislative advocacy. And this is specific to government. And when we're thinking about legislative advocacy, um, we're thinking about things like lobbyists. Well, a lot of times in our minds, when we think about lobbyists, we're thinking about giant oil companies hiring a bunch of people to go and give money to senators. Um, but that's not really what it's about at a state level. So we do have lobbyists and those lobbyists, what they help us do is follow the legislation so we know what's there. And if we wanna introduce legislation, they help us write it and they help us navigate through the process of getting that legislation passed. And so lobbyists, like yes, they help us register for bills, whether we're for something or against something. And they are there to have conversations and talk to senators and, um, House representatives to, to get them to kind of see that the legislation we'd like to support is important for the citizens of Iowa. Um, but we're not throwing thousands of dollars at senators or representatives. That's not what it's about. Lobbyists help us navigate a really kind of complicated process. And so we're thankful to have them and they provide an invaluable service to our profession. So another part of advocacy is everyday advocacy. And there are four main components of that everyday advocacy. So the first component is self-advocacy. So this might be you in a workplace, right? That I am advocating for pay, benefits, caseload, um, things that might protect me as a clinician. Um, so any of those things would be considered self-advocacy. It might also be that you're a practitioner who has um, a disability of your own. So it's navigating what kind of accommodations do I need in my workplace? 
So um, when I was an undergrad, I worked for a student, I worked for a professor who was blind. And so there were accommodations that the workplace provided him. So he was able to do his job. And so part of that is self-advocacy. And we talk a lot about self-advocacy for our clients, um, for students we see, but the reality is that that self-advocacy begins with us and we need to be able to negotiate and collaborate as it relates to our own rights as practitioners. That second piece is family. So we think about ourselves and our family and advocating for our family, but also many of us might have our own children or family members that have impairments. And so what does it look like for me to advocate? Well, if I have a parent who really needs a hearing aid, how do we work out? How do we get the audiologist? How do we find money to pay for that hearing aid? How do we provide maybe oral rehab services? Where would we go for that? And so um, as a, a family member, communication and hearing and swallowing impairments impact us as well. So how am I helping use my profession and my knowledge to advocate for my family? And um, as we advocate for our own families, we learn more about helping our patients, clients advocate for their families. So just remember that the things we do in our own life have a direct relationship to the kind of advocacy that we are able to do for our clients. The next level of advocacy every day is our community advocacy. So I get the newspaper every day and I read it every day. And um, that is not something that people do as often anymore, but it's really important for me because the only way I can advocate for my community is if I know what's going on in my community. And so it's a way for me to get local news that allows me to make the right phone calls, to have the right conversations, to make sure that uh, the children that I serve specifically have the resources they need. And so just keep in mind that when we're thinking about community, number one, we have to be part of a community, right? We can't just say, well, I live there, but I'm not really part of the community. We need to think about what our community is and then identify how do we find out information about what's happening in that community? And then how can I take action? If it's not your community, it's much harder to take any kind of action. So just remember that that community membership that you have, identify your communities and how can you advocate for that group that you're a part of. And another level of advocate, advocacy is that workplace advocacy. And this is both um, general work policies, but also it's about protecting our clients, making sure that they have access to services and, you know, when I think about, you know, workplace advocacy, we've talked a lot about it in kind of the time of COVID, right? How do we have enough protective gear for everyone? How do we make sure that patients are, they come in without COVID? How do we make sure they leave without COVID? Um, and so we're thinking about these policies that keep us safe and keep our clients safe. So what can you do, right? When we're thinking about this everyday advocacy, Make sure to vote, right? Our votes can be very powerful and voting sends messages. So please, I encourage you to vote. If you're a college student, go ahead and get registered to vote where you're at. Um, you can always move, right? Like if you're here now, vote here. If you move, change where you vote, right? That don't give up your opportunity to vote because you may not be living in a community for very long. One of the most important things we can do is share our story. A lot of people, don't know what audiologists and speech language pathologists do. They're much more likely to know what a physical therapist does or an occupational therapist, in part because physical therapists see people who don't consider themselves to have a disability. Like, oh, I had, I had like so shoulder surgery, so I'm going to go see the PT, right? And so we have a lot, a lot of people who do not consider themselves disabled who go and see physical therapists. But for speech language pathologists and audiologists, we are seeing people who have disabilities. It's not like, oh, we're just going to work on that for four weeks and we're going to do it two times a week and you're going to be good to go. None of us say that. Like, that's not the world that we live in. And so fewer people interact with speech language pathologists and audiologists. And so by sharing our stories, by sharing the stories of the people we work with, we have a much larger impact 
when we're thinking about informing people, when we're thinking about if we think something is really important in our legislative advocacy, how do we talk to senators and representatives and let them know like, hey, this is why it's important. Those stories make a difference. And so for you, um, you know, collect stories, right? That, that think about, intentionally think about and remember when we made a difference, right? When we can just pull those out and say, hey, my best experience in clinic was, I know I changed someone's life because those have a lot more power than just a bunch of numbers. And so your stories really are important. And the last thing that, um, not the last thing, but the last thing I'm going to talk about that you can do is join an organization with the same goals. A big part of what Aisha does is this advocacy piece for speech language pathologists and audiologists in Iowa. And so um, many of you are already members of Aisha, but if you are a student, I really encourage you um, to join whatever state association you're in. This is what states do. We advocate for our professions and we advocate for our clients. So think about joining those organizations who also believe in those same things. And kind of my final point, this is from um, former Speaker of the House, James Wright. Um, I found this quote, I don't really know a lot about, James, well, I mean, I read a lot on Wikipedia about James Wright yesterday. Um, I know way, like some of you may know a lot about him. Um, so I know what Wikipedia tells me about James Wright, but I know he was a house speaker. Uh, but this quote of his really stuck out to me, and I think it is um, really important to what we do when it comes to advocacy. If you are wondering whether or not to communicate your views, consider that others who disagree with you are doing so constantly. And that's the reality, right? That we can say, well, I don't know if they want to hear from me. I don't know if my message is gonna get through or everyone has the same feeling I do, so why would I say anything? The reality is each voice is very, very important. And if you really support something, there probably is someone on the other side who doesn't. And so it's important for you to remember that your individual voice is significant. Your individual voice does make a difference in advocacy on all of the levels. So, are there any questions? Thanks so much, Rachel. And while we um, uh, wait for any questions, if folks have those, go ahead and put them in the chat. Feel free to raise your hand. Uh, we have Sarah back. I think the technical difficulties she was experiencing are fixed. And so we can go ahead and turn it over to Sarah. Of course, two years later, we're still dealing with fun technology things. <laughs> um, I apologize for that. My computer decided it was going to update. Why not? Um, so I was going to talk about the current bills that Aisha is following along with. Um, our main, kind of our main priority for the last two years has been the interstate compact. So what this bill is, is it allows for states who are part of the compact to have similar licensure standards. Um, this makes it so that if you move, um, you're not, if you move to a state where they're part of the compact, you don't have to have a whole new set of standards for licensure. Um, right now, states are very varied with their requirements. Um, so this makes it a little bit more uniform. Um, so last year, SLPs and audiologists um, were both for this bill and it did not pass Senate um, subcommittee. There was one um, legislator who was against it, and it just didn't pass that subcommittee that he was on. This year, um, we decided that the best way to go about this was to join the Occupational Therapy Licensure Compact. This, um, they also did not get their compact passed last year, but instead of it not passing the Senate, it didn't pass the House. While ours passed the House, it didn't pass the Senate. Um, so on Monday, um, the amendment to join the Occupational Therapy Licensure Compact and um, the SLP and Audiology Compact, it did pass out of committee. Um, so it will now go to the floor to be um, debated on and voted on. 
Um, we are really hopeful that this will pass for all of us, for our friends that are occupational therapies and SLPs and audiologists. Um, I do want to add like a personal story um, because just as this was coming out, I was like, I don't really know how this will impact me. Um, but this past fall, um, I am a school-based SLP and we had several maternity leaves in my region and we could not get those filled. Um, and so we were working with a telehealth company and there was one SLP and I think they're from Georgia that was interested in doing it, but they could not get their Iowa licensure done in time. Um, there was a lot of requirements and the SLP didn't do it. Um, and so if we were part of this compact, it really would have been nice that there wouldn't have been a whole different set of standards um, to do it because what ended up happening was myself and two other SLPs had to cover the caseload for the SLP um, while she was gone for 13 weeks. And that just added a lot more stress. Um, and so, yeah, it would have been really nice had this passed last year. But that's just a little personal touch of how this bill would really impact us as professionals. Um, so one of the other bills here, hopefully this will let me go. Um, so the lead K bill, this has been a bill that has previously been of concern for Aisha. Um, luckily it did not pass funnel this year. Um, we have been against it in previous years. Um, really it forces the deaf and hard of hearing population to choose one language over the other. Um, and there's some other minuscule things in there that really were not best practice. Um, and so we had been against it, but luckily it did not pass through. So we don't have to worry about that um, being passed this year. Um, Senate file 2193, this is our cognitive screening bill. Um, we are currently in support of this. So what this allows for is for audiologists um, to be completing cogn cognitive screenings um, as they are very capable of doing so. Um, and it is scheduled for a hearing in the subcommittee tomorrow morning. So we are hopeful that this will um, continue to go through the steps and be passed um, in both the Senate and then the House. Um, House file 2245, this is the telehealth reimbursement bill. Um, so this would require health carriers to reimburse mental health professionals that don't currently live in Iowa, um, but are completing their services for citizens in Iowa. Um, and it would reimburse them for that. Um, so that would be very nice and it would impact our clients. Um, and then House File 2188. Um, this is the bill that talks about providing hearing aid coverage to all children under 18. Um, this unfortunately did not make it past the funnel as well. Um, but <laughs> Stephanie Fleckenstein, the, who also serves on our Aisha board and is a professor at um, University of Iowa, said it has made it farther this year than it ever has in the past. So um, we are hopeful that that will continue to happen in the future um, and maybe be passed in future legislative seasons. So those are the bills in a nutshell. Um, I know that our um, lobbyists are going to go into more about the interstate compact and where we stand with it. Um, we have received money from ASHA, like grant money, to really be supporting this, as this is across the entire nation that um, there's a big push for the interstate compact. Um, so we are appreciative of our lobbyists for doing all of their work on the um, interstate compact and we really could not thank them more because they have done a lot for us as Aisha, um, for all of us as professionals. So does anyone have any questions about any of that? I know I went over it kind of quickly. Um, Sarah, we have a question at Ambrose. <clears throat> um, how often do they vote on these different bills? 
basically what's the legislative season look like? I'm going to say that's a good question for our lobbyists. I don't know the answer to that. I don't know. Natalie, could you help us out on that? I can answer that. Okay. I can answer that. <laughs> so basically the, with the legislative session, is set up for people who farm. So that's the first thing to know, right? So we don't have legislation that runs all year long. We have basically January to April is when our legislative sessions are. And so at the there are three parts. The first part, basically you work in either the House or the Senate and you work on your own bills. And then we have a point called the funnel. And so everything has to be passed from the House or the Senate because in the second half of the session, you send it to the next group, right? So if it's been working in the Senate, we pass it in the Senate. Then after the funnel, it goes to the House. And so the House starts working on the things the Senate passed, and the Senate works on the things the House passed. And then um, <clears throat> there's a certain amount of time. We get all that work done, right? Some things pass, some things don't. They go to the governor whenever they get passed. So like the governor signed a bunch of stuff into law over the last couple of weeks because we're at that point, right? We've gone through the first funnel and now we're starting to see things that both the House and the Senate have passed. And then the final part of the session is really about money, right? So it's the, the budget, um, sometimes it's about education, but they can't leave until they've dealt with the money issue. And so though things should be done in April, they could last and last and last and last. Um, so that's basically the three parts, right? So we work on the business in our own section of the legislature. Then we transition in this funnel point where if it doesn't pass, it doesn't pass. And of course there are a gazillion rules. So sometimes things are still secretly alive and all this other stuff. But the general rule is get it out of your house, send it to the other group. They're gonna vote on it. And either it's gonna pass there or it's not. Thank you for that explanation. We have another question. Can you explain the lead K a little bit more? I think it's happening all over the country, so. Stephanie, would you like to talk about that? Sure, I can, yeah, yeah, yeah. So um, that is a bill that has been proposed for many, many years actually, and the idea behind it is that children who are deaf or hard of hearing need to have some kind of monitor evaluation and monitoring process to make sure that they are ready for kindergarten, um, where they have the, the communication language and liter literacy skills that will um, lead them to success in school. And um, the way it's written it does, as Sarah mentioned, it does um, kind of focus on American Sign Language as the mode of communication. And um, while that's appropriate for some children and families, it's not necessarily appropriate for all children and families of, um, um, of, of children who are hard of hearing in particular. So um, the, the wording that is in that bill um, is, is um, yeah, again, it's kind of focused on that, that language of preference and for all kids. So um, there's a lot of work happening with the Department of Education to um, try to reword things within that bill or, or at least look at the state in general and how the monitoring and evaluation process is going and see if there are resources already in place that can be um, used in a better way to ensure these kiddos are ready for, for, the, um, for school. And um, so that's kind of the, where it's at. And um, yeah, we'll, we'll see where it, where it goes, where it, where it ends up going um, in future years, but it is on hold. And, and continued conversations will be occurring between the Department of Education and um, professionals across the state to, um, to work through that process. Thank you, Stephanie. 
one of the other things about Lead K is that um, we are concerned about the ASL being the, the language of choice, particularly for families where English isn't even their first language. So what, what the bill does is it removes a lot of rights that parents may have for how they choose to educate their children. And, um, and Iowa actually has some of the best AL, ASL services in the nation. And we are, are in fact kind of the top of the game and it's much harder to find some of the other modes of communication. So one of the things we've been working on is alternative legislation. There have been some other states that have passed alternative legislation to Lee K that basically directs the Department of Education to create these screening tools because that's their job, right? That's their job to make sure that children are ready and prepared. And so um, that's something that we're working on with Matt and Kate and those are our lobbyists and our, our legislators. And it's something that is probably gonna be a next year, right? Like it's, can't get everything done at one time, but that's what we're looking towards is having a different kind of legislation because we know how critical it is for all children to be able to read and write and be ready for school. We just don't agree with the one size fits all of the bill because we recognize how much diversity there is in communication, in family preference, and in hearing loss, right? That a child who is deaf is not the same as a child who is hard of hearing, that those things are very different. And even in hard of hearing, we have a lot of differences. And so we wanna make sure that all children truly have an individualized education plan. And so that's why we're working on alternate legislation that would allow for that individuality for each child. Thanks, Rachel. It looks like Kate has joined us from the Capitol. So I'm gonna go ahead and turn it over to Kate Walton. And Kate, while you're getting connected, I will just check in. Did you want to run your slides or would you like Emily to run those? Um, if Emily could run them, that would be great. That's perfect. She's got those queued and ready to go. And Very we good. tested the video. So I think we should be able to <laughs> get that up and running for you here. So we'll Wonderful. Them... And I apologize. I know it sounds like I'm in an airport. There's just so much background noise here. It's hard to find a quiet place. So um, I put my headphones in. So hopefully that will help. Um, and we'll move um, through this presentation. Um, I know that Senator Kanoy or um, Maddie confirmed with her that she'll be on at noon. So um, we'll move through this pretty quickly. If you want to go to the next slide. Uh, there's uh, Matt 80, who's also on the line. You can see him. He looks like he's hiding in a closet, but he uh, is, is in the stairwell trying to find a closet. I'm in a stairwell. <laughs> It's a really glamorous job. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, this is just a, uh, some photos of uh, how things have been at the Capitol here in the first part of the session. Um, you can see here um, in the upper right-hand corner, we have Maddie Bradley, who's also working with us this session. She's been a huge asset. Um, you know, this session is sort of the first what I would characterize as normal uh, session that we have had in a couple of years. As you all know, in 2020, things uh, closed down fairly abruptly. And last year, there were a lot fewer people in the building um, than there have been this year. We're back to having public, more public events um, and, and more people in, in this space this year. And you can see kind of an array of pictures. And, a couple of, of opportunities to see where Matt and I hide out to try to find quiet places to do a phone call. Um, so next slide, please. So this is a, a quick overview of the governor's stated priorities for this legislative session. Um, these were you know, all mentioned during her condition of the state address the first week of session. We have tax reform, uh, education reform. So. The tax reform bill has passed and been signed by the governor. It was signed yesterday. Um, we do expect a cleanup bill, but I don't think it will substantially change the, the outcome of that. Education reform, um, I'm sure you all have seen, there's been a lot of attention on increasing what's being referred to as parents' rights with um, you know, curriculum and content that is available to children and being taught to children. Um, 
there is also a fairly significant um, we call it, uh, education savings account vouchers in the governor's bill it's referred to as the students first scholarship program. Um, that bill enjoys a lot of support in the Iowa Senate, but less support in the Iowa House and has been a big priority of the governor's this session. There's regulatory changes that are really tied towards growing the workforce. And then E15, which is uh, biofuels ethanol. Next slide, please. Um, this here is a photo that includes the Republican leadership uh, in the House and Senate. You'll see the Senate Majority Leader is Jack Whitver and the Senate President Jake Chapman, uh, House Speaker Pat Grassley, who's the grandson of Senator Charles Grassley, and the Majority Leader Matt Winschittle. Uh, I won't read these to you, but these are our stated priorities and things that they have been working on this legislative session. Um, we've seen a lot of attention around vaccine mandates how they're used, um, when they can be required, who can require vaccines, uh, the tax cuts we've already covered, uh, education funding. This legislative yeah. session, the state supplemental assistance was set at 2.5%, which was the governor's proposal and the house's proposal. Uh, the Senate came in, I believe at 2.25 and then came up uh, during negotiations. The house has also included an additional $19 million supplemental that wouldn't be included in the base of SSA for the next uh, school year. The Senate has not acted on that yet. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, here we have the De Senate Democratic leader, Zach Walls. He's from the Coralville area. And then the House Major Minority Leader, Democratic leader, Jennifer Converse, who's from Windsor Heights here near Des Moines. Um, these are some of the things that they have been really pushing and prioritizing. Um, particularly around public school enrollment and opposition to the education savings accounts or vouchers, uh, child care and mental health. Those are the, are the themes we really hear them uh, hitting. Matt, do you have anything you want to add to these uh, last few slides that I've moved through quickly? Uh, no, I know just the Democrats are trying to find their space and their voice and to uh, really good leaders from the Democrats and I engage with quite a bit and I think they'll get uh, better and better and, and be competitive as the years go on. I agree with that. Uh, next slide, please. So this is sort of the game plan as we talk about things in this legislative session on behalf of the association to be really focused on priorities, which we'll cover consistent in our messaging, uh, including um, the local delegation and community involvement of all of you as members of the association and students. Uh, next slide, please. So I'm going to move really quickly through um, the post funnel bills of interest. I came in um, hearing you discuss the lead K bill, which we'll certainly touch on. And if you've already been over this, <laughs> you can give me the wrap it up signal. Um, but the, the first one here is the Occupational Therapy Interstate Licensure Compact. And this is a little bit down in the weeds of legislative process, but uh, the speech language pathologists have been working on an interstate licensure compact and also the occupational therapists have been working on an interstate licensure compact. The speech uh, SLP interstate compact passed the house last legislative session and the occupational therapy uh, compact passed the Senate, but neither were considered by the other chamber. So we have joined forces. Um, that bill, the, so Senate file 463 is the OT licensure compact. The SLP licensure compact was amended to that bill this week uh, and has been sent to the Senate as a joint bill. And what an interstate licensure compact does is make those uh, licenses in the states that are part of a compact. Um, it, 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 it provides uh, better accessibility if you choose to practice in a state that is part of the interstate licensure compact and also accountability uh, towards anybody who has licensure issues or disciplinary issues. Um, and then uh, communication back through the compact on those things, um, as well as providing better opportunities or not better, but uh, more straightforward opportunities for providing telehealth services in other states and allowing for that licensure. 
um, Matt and I were able to talk with the Senate, um, uh, Senator Costello, who is running Senate File 463 about the amendment and feel pretty good that he's going to include that amendment when he runs the bill in the Senate. Because procedurally, it will not have to go back through committee. Um, that would be the last stop on the way to the governor's desk if that amendment is adopted and the bill is passed. The next bill on this list is related to cognitive screenings. Um, this was proposed by the licensure board to make clear that these cognitive screenings are in the scope of practice and licensure. Um, and since that was done through the administrative rules process, some of the legislators who sit on that uh, rules committee felt that that was better served by legislation by um, the full House and Senate. So uh, Senator Waylon Brown filed the bill, uh, passed through state government in the Senate unanimously, um, passed the floor unanimously pretty easily. Uh, we don't, there's no opposition to the bill. Uh, and there's a subcommittee on this bill in the House uh, tomorrow morning at 8.30, actually. The notice just came out a little while ago. So um, we're, right again, we're optimistic that that will continue to move uh, easily through the process. Uh, the next bill, uh, it, this uh, House File 2491 in its original form would have required insurance to cover hearing aids for children who are under the age of 18. Um, the bill that has now been amended would uh, take would go to that hearing aid assistance fund that's in the Department of Public Health, takes out the third party administration and makes it a grant program um, with the hopes that it will uh, be able to serve more children in that capacity. Uh, insurance mandates are very, very difficult to pass. Uh, the, you can see in the photo, Dr. Walker, who's an AISHA member, came to testify in support of that. And you can also see in the picture that there are a number of children and families who are, who are there working on that bill. And they did, from an advocacy perspective, just a terrific job. It was, you know, that it can be hard and intimidating to come into this space. And they really did a nice job telling their story and, and explaining uh, why this would be important and meaningful to their family. So um, I'm hopeful that this bill and with its amendment will continue to move forward and then we can continue to talk about those insurance issues. Um, it sounds like you covered the lead K uh, issues pretty thoroughly. Um, that bill is, in, is on hold and we do not expect it to advance this session. Um, another thing that comes up from time to time is music therapy and how, those, um, how that interacts scope of practice wise. Um, the music therapist passed a bill last legislative session related to title protection for their profession. Uh, they did not engage a lobbyist this session and did not have a bill uh, to bring forward. So at least for the time being, I think we're, in, um, you know, that's that issue is at least on pause. Um, Matt, is there anything you want to throw in on any of those? I know I went through them pretty quickly. No, it's been uh, it's been a pretty active couple years, and and Kate's done a marvelous job with some very tricky procedural matters, very tricky, and so she deserves a lot of accolades, in my opinion. Thanks, Matt. Uh, we can go to the next slide. So this is, we're going to move through now um, with the time that we have left of kind of a legislative overview or the process for uh, the legislature. This is um, a visual representation of the legislative makeup. As you can see in the house, there are 60 Republicans, 40 Democrats, Senate 32 Republicans, 18 Democrats and the Iowa governor Kim Reynolds is a Republican. Um, these are fairly substantial Republican majorities that we expect to continue to grow based on the redistricting that was enacted in October of last year. I think we could see this number climb as high as potentially 65 Republicans in the House and as high as maybe 35 Republicans in the Senate. It's hard to say, but we do expect that majority to, to remain solidly Republican uh, in the House and Senate. The governor, um, her the only announcement candidate for the Democratic primary is um, Deirdre DeJure. De De uh, she has not been particularly well funded. Uh, and the governor right now is, uh, you know, it's a long way to election day, but right now is sitting um, looking pretty uh, solid for re-election uh, in the fall. Next slide, please. Uh, so this is probably the most important slide of the whole presentation. 
You have Republicans who are in charge of the House, Senate, and governor, uh, governor's office it does not necessarily mean agreement between the parties. And so this is where I'm going to throw it to Matt to talk a little bit more about that. Yeah, and you know, we've seen this play out in other states and both Kate and I think the state house is going to remain uh, Republican for quite a while and probably the governor's seat too. What tends to happen, you have kind of the establishment Republicans, the more, uh, you know, George Bush, the first Republicans uh, who are most interested in a balanced budget and taxes versus the more social conservatives, religious conservatives. And we're seeing a little bit of that now where they're building heads on some issues and that tends to grow as as the years go by and the majority of the same party starts to mature so there's going to be a just because it's one party doesn't mean it's just everything's going to fly through um, that doesn't happen in fact i think the um, battle lines will uh, grow clearer here as the majority matures Go to the next slide, please. So this is the uh, legislation and the legislative process part of the uh, presentation with my uh, very favorite video that will show my age, a little overview of how a bill becomes a law. Um, Natalie, do you start this? Yeah, you start this. You sure got to climb a lot of steps to get to this Capitol building here in Washington. Well, I wonder who that sad little scrap of paper is. I'm just a bill. Yes, I'm only a bill. And I'm sitting here on Capitol Hill. Well, it's a long, long journey to the capital city. It's a long, long wait while I'm sitting in committee. But I know I'll be a law someday, at least I hope and pray that I will. But today I am still just a bill. Gee, Bill, you certainly have a lot of patience and courage. Well, I got this far. When I started, I wasn't even a bill. I was just an idea. Some folks back home decided they wanted a law passed, so they called their local congressman, and he said, you're right, there ought to be a law. Then he sat down and wrote me out and introduced me to Congress, and I became a bill. And I'll remain a bill until they decide to make me a law. I'm just a bill. Yes, I'm only a bill. And I got as far as Capitol Hill. Well, now I'm stuck in committee, and I'll sit here and wait. While a few key congressmen discuss and debate whether they should let me be a law, I hope and pray that they will. But today I am still just a bill. Listen to those congressmen arguing. Is all that discussion and debate about you? Yeah, I'm one of the lucky ones. Most bills never even get this far. I hope they decide to report on me favorably, otherwise I may die. Die? Yeah, die in committee. Oh, but it looks like I'm going to live. Now I go to the House of Representatives and they vote on me. If they vote yes, what happens? Then I go to the Senate and the whole thing starts all over again. Oh, no. Oh, yes. I'm just a bill. Yes, I'm only a bill. And if they vote for me on Capitol Hill, well, then I'm off to the White House where I'll wait in a line with a lot of other bills for the president to sign. And if he signs me, then I'll be a law. I hope and pray that he will. But today I am still just a bill. You mean even if the whole Congress says you should be a law, the president can still say no? Yes, that's called a veto. If the president vetoes me, I have to go back to Congress and they vote on me again, and by that time you're so By old, that time, it's very unlikely that you become a law. It's not easy to become a law, is it? No. But how I hope and pray that I will, but today I am still just a bill. He signed your bill, now you're a law. Oh, yeah. Okay, we can go to the next slide. So that bill or that little video probably summarizes the, the next few slides. You can see again that was that that 
video is for the federal, you know, U.S. House, U.S. Uh, Senate. But the process is the same here in Iowa, where, you know, it begins as an idea, a bill is filed, it goes to subcommittee, full committee to the full chamber, and then repeats again on the other side. Um, I would say just here, the best place to make that public input on a piece of legislation that you care about is at the subcommittee level. It is the most public part of the process. Uh, the public is invited to attend. In the House, you can watch the subcommittee um, via WebEx. In the Senate, you're able to provide comments via Zoom. Uh, and so that, that is a very, very good uh, place to provide that uh, public input on legislation, which doesn't mean you can't write along, but that is, that's the place where the most work gets done on further refining and, and perfecting legislation. Uh, next slide, please. So again, just a visual of you know a bill going from subcommittee to full standing committee to the full chamber is, is how the bill moves through the process in, on each side. Next slide, please. So the structure of the subcommittee, um, as you can see here, is that each subcommittee has a chair, uh, always a Republican. There's a second subcommittee member who is also Republican. And then the Democrat gets one member uh, of the subcommittee. Then that reports out to the full committee. And you can see that structure there on the left where there's a committee chair, a vice chair, and a ranking member, and then the members of the membership of the committee. Kate, I'll just um, jump in and, and, yeah. and say that uh, it's much, much easier to stop a bill or kill a bill throughout this maze of a process uh, than it is to pass a bill. Uh, very few bills pass. There are so many built-in obstacles to prevent bills from passing, um, as we saw on our licensure one, where Kate had to do some chicanery and trickery uh, to get it amended on another bill. To have, and it was very complicated, but um, it's really hard to get something through and. and just appreciate the efforts and all the help that the members gave on that bill and other bills. Because you, need, you really need the grassroots to get it through. Yes, I think that's a really good point, Matt. Um, every year, uh, right around just under 10% of the bills that are introduced ultimately go on to be signed by the governor. Um, so, that, and that number holds true across parties and administrations. It's, it's you know, usually somewhere between seven and 9% of bills are ultimately uh, signed by the governor. Uh, next slide, please. So this is the legislative timetable you will see on the left, um, pulling out a couple of key dates. The legislature has some self-imposed deadlines that they put in place. The first one has already passed, it's called the first funnel deadline. And at that point, all bills have to, all policy bills, have to have been reported out of committee in one chamber in order to remain eligible for consideration for the rest of the year. Um, ways and means bills, which are related to taxes and fees, and appropriations bills are uh, exempt from the funnel deadline. So the second funnel deadline is coming up here in a few weeks. And at that point, all policy bills have to have been voted on by one chamber and passed out of committee in the second chamber in order to remain eligible for consideration. So this really narrows the, the focus of the legislature on the bills that they're going to work on. By, the, by this time in the session, you have a pretty clear shot of the things that are going to at least have a good idea of moving forward. Target adjournment this year is April 19th. That's the 100th day of the legislative session. In even numbered years or election years, the legislative session is scheduled for 100 days. And in odd number of years, um, they are scheduled for 110 days. That is how long legislators are paid a per diem in order to be here. Um, there's a chance, I've lost every adjournment that I've ever made, but there's a chance they could finish up early this year. Uh, the passage of the tax bill really has kind of accelerated things. Um, so I think there, there's a good chance we'll see work begin on the budget uh, starting next week and, and they may well be done the first week in April. Uh, next slide, please. So these are just a quick list of the committees and chambers. These are screen grabs from uh, the legislative website. You can see they're broken down by topic. Um, most commonly, uh, Aisha 
finds itself uh, dealing with the human resources committee or the state government committee. Uh, state government tends, in the, particularly in the Senate, to work on issues related to licensure, scope of practice, uh, and human resources in the House tends to deal with licensure and scope of practice. So these are the, the committees we most commonly work on. And then you'll see the list of appropriations subcommittee also broken down by topic. Um, and each of those subcommittees works on a budget that is ultimately passed and sent to the governor. Next slide, please. So these are the key legislators in the Human Resources Committee. Um, you can see that um, particularly Ann Meyer in the House, Joel Fry in the House, and then um, Senators Edler and Costello um, are really, really key legislators in those areas. And um, people who are paying very close attention will know that Senator Costello is the chair of the Budget Committee and is also the floor manager of the compact bill we are working to pass. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, this is just a quick overview of the fiscal note process. This is how the Legislative Services Agency provides information to the legislature on what their proposals would, what kind of budget impact they would typically have. Uh, next slide, please. So this is again, making its way through the process. Once a bill, for example, using the compact bill as an example, uh, is now in the Senate. That is, its, uh, that is its last stop, assuming they accept the amendment before it goes to the governor for, for her signature or veto. I will say with Republicans in charge of both the House, Senate, and then the governor's office, vetoes are pretty rare. We haven't seen very many of them in that uh, setting. Even when there's divided government, by that point, they've usually worked out the things that they're going to, to work on. Uh, next slide, please. And then obviously the the Final stop is the Iowa code book. Uh, next slide, I think is the last one. Let's see. And I see that Senator Knoyer is on the line. Um, I do have to sign off. So I'm gonna turn it over to Matt uh, to introduce Senator Knoyer um, for the group, if that's uh, good with all of you. Yeah, Chris, you're on there. That's great. Um, uh, super thrilled to have uh, Chris Knoyer, who's state senator from LeClaire over in Scott County, and uh, she'll be running for re-election in a new district um, in November this year. So uh, Chris is a very good friend of, of mine and Kate's, and uh, she controls the education uh, appropriations budget and uh, chairs that subcommittee along with a colleague in the house. Uh, very influential, a big chunk of the state budget goes through the uh, committee that, that Chris chairs. And uh, can't say enough uh, accolades and good things about Senator Knoyer. And I'm gonna turn it over to Chris to talk about yourself a little bit and your background and, and then kind of take some questions from our members. Sure. Well, thank you for that introduction, Matt. Um, it's my honor to be here. Thank you for the invitation. And uh, as Matt said, I'm in my fourth year here in the state Senate. And before I was in the state Senate, I was on the Pleasant Valley School Board for six years. Uh, so I serve uh, on the education committee. Um, I'm also the education budget chair and I'm on state government. I'm the vice chair of state government. I'm also on the natural resources and environment and appropriations committee. So um, I, I, I'm, I'm glad that you invited me to be on this call because uh, we, I just had some constituents come to me from uh, DeWitt uh, who had uh, two, young, uh, two of their sons have hearing aids. And so I filed the hearing aid bill this year. And I wasn't sure if that was what Kate was running through there with you. But um, I have to say that in that subcommittee in both the House and the Senate, it was probably some of the best advocacy, like grassroots advocacy that I've ever seen in a subcommittee where parents and their children came and advocated on their own behalf. And it was really very effective. Um, they were very knowledgeable. They shared firsthand experiences and really educated the legislators on what the issue was. So I'm sure we'll talk more about that on this call. Um, so I just wanna, I'm the mother of four children. I live between LeClaire and Princeton, right on the Mississippi River. And I'll just conclude, that'll be my introduction. How's that? <laughs> Thank you. 
I don't know if we want to, want to go to questions. Bill or, or do you want to just open it up to questions? I'll start off if, uh, with the question for the group uh, to kind of warm things up here. Uh, Chris, could you talk about your typical day when you arrive at the Capitol and, and what you do all day and, and uh, the meetings you have, et cetera? Okay, well, I, I'm not sure there is a typical day here, honestly. Um, first of all, I'm a, I'm a self-employed website designer from Eastern Iowa, so I'm certainly not used to getting up and doing my hair and putting makeup on and, and a suit, clothes like this. So uh, that's, you know, the first part of my day is just getting ready. Um, and trying to find some comfortable shoes that don't kill me after a long day at the Capitol. But, um, you know, a typical day, you know, generally there's uh, groups that come in from all across Iowa, different advocacy groups, and it usually starts with some sort of breakfast reception to meet with those groups. Um, those usually run from seven to nine. In the Iowa Senate, we gavel in at nine o'clock. And, uh, you know, we start with a prayer and the Pledge of Allegiance and introductions. And then uh, we jump right into it. So the first part of the legislative session is usually going through all these bills and, with subcommittees and uh, committees. Um, and then we get through the first funnel, which I, I love the first funnel because, um, you know, there are just hundreds and hundreds of bills that get filed every year. And, and uh, the first, if they don't survive the subcommittee and committee process, and they don't make it through that first funnel. So we can kind of get rid of all those, what I call nonsense bills that tend to distract people um, uh, and get people riled up that have no chance of going through. So once we get through the funnels, um, we, can, we can actually um, focus on the bills that are priorities that are really gonna make an impact on I-1. So, um, you know, the first, the first part of the, the year is, or, or the session is generally subcommittee work and committee work. And then the, and then at the end, we start looking at budgets, um, but I can't look at the budget until, uh, well, I can start looking at the budget, but we are, we have to use the lower of the two, uh, revenue estimating conference numbers that we get in December and March. So I can't really start building my education budget until I see that number in March, but we're optimistic that it'll be higher in March. So the numbers from December are good. So, um, you know, the good news is that the Iowa, the state of Iowa is in good fiscal shape. And so, uh, you know, we've got budget surpluses and uh, we're doing really well from a budget standpoint. So I'm hoping that my uh, $1 billion education budget will increase um, so that I can fund, um, you know, the priorities in the education budget that include the school for the deaf, um, uh, school for the blind, community colleges, regent universities, um, early ch childhood Iowa, programs like IJAG, um, college student aid, the student loan repayment programs and such like that. So I'm looking forward to that. So the last part of my session will be focused on that budget work and, and you know coming to an agreement with my house colleagues. But um, I don't know that there's a typical day. Um, I do love the fact that we have people um, that are starting to come up to the Capitol. Last year, we really didn't have a lot of people coming up here because of COVID. So I appreciate the fact that we have people coming up and advocating. Um, and something that I'll say that I'm proud of that we have in the Iowa Senate that came out of COVID is uh, we have uh, Zoom meetings, um, subcommittees uh, in the Senate. Um, we are in person and via Zoom. So if a member of the public wants to participate in a subcommittee, they don't have to um, drive to Des Moines for a 30 minute subcommittee. They can jump on the Zoom call and participate um, and provide feedback for or against a bill via Zoom, which I think is really a great way to do it and get public input on bills. So I'm, I'm really proud that we've made that permanent in the Iowa Senate. They're not quite there in the house, um, but you know, I'll say that we, we like to lead on things like that in the Senate. And I'm sure my house colleagues would differ on that. But um, anyway, I don't know that there's a typical day here, but I do know that I sleep very well at night when I am in, um, in Des Moines, because uh, at, the end of a, at the end of the day, I usually get out of here around six and usually there's more receptions in the evening um, with different advocacy groups. So I usually get home around nine and fall fast asleep and sleep very well while I'm here. So um, I see there's a question um, from Scott Daly. I don't know who's in charge of unmuting, but there you go. Hello, I'm a speech pathologist at the University of Iowa Hospice and Clinics. And my question is in regards to what is the best way for people to contact you if they are sharing a concern or a personal story? Yeah, first of all, I toured your, um, is it the Iconic Chamber? Can you help me with that? Oh, Anna, Anna, Anna. call it Chamber. 
Yes, I'm no, sorry was... I mispronounced that. I got a tour of that a couple of weeks ago, and that's really cool. They put us in there and turned the lights off, <laughs> which was really cool. But it was really cool to see how you're utilizing that for speech and hearing research. So um, I just, fun fact that I stopped by there and went on a tour there. My, I have a son that's at the University of Iowa, and he got to go on it with me. But um, in terms of getting in touch with us, um, email, legislative email, um, we have clerks that go through our emails. Um, you know, I would say that personal emails uh, that share, you know, the story or a specific bill with the, how it impacts your either your industry or, you know, your personal life, I think are very impactful. We get a lot of those like click here to email your legislator and it's just a canned email. And I'll tell you, those don't nearly have the impact on me personally as a personal email from someone that is a subject matter expert like yourself in the field. Um, or a parent of a child or, um, you know, somebody that's experiencing the impact personally. Um, I would say, um, you know, in terms of like, you know, I'll take this um, uh, uh, hearing, the bill that we have uh, for insurance to cover um, children under 18, the hearing aids. Um, I'm going to take that bill as an example. I met with this family from DeWitt um, last summer um, during the interim. I think if you really want to get good legislative path legislation passed, it's good to do the work during the interim so that you can, you know, really do a thorough job of researching it and pulling the, the language together so it's teed up and ready to go when we come back in January. Um, I don't, I, I don't want to say that it's too late by the time you get to January, but I do know that once we get back here in January, it's a whirlwind of activity so that we can get te things teed up in November and December so they're ready to go and they're vetted. Um, I think that's a great way to advocate. So I met with this family at a park and you know, the boy, I talked to the boys, I talked to the parents and, you know, they had a one pager for me that had really the impact of the legislation and how it would affect their, not only their children, but kids across the state, um, if they can get the cost of their hearing aids covered by insurance. And then we can increase the fund that helps parents offset the cost of hearing aids. Um, I, I, I just think that that is some of the best impactful advocacy and be respectful. I mean, I, you know, it, it frustrates me that sometimes, you know, people see the letter behind my name and they just make assumptions about me. And, and, you know, your legislator might not have the letter behind their name that you agree with politically, but they're the person that you have in the legislature. So, you know, develop a relationship with them and offer to be their subject matter expert whenever they do have questions in your field. Um, you know, I, I, I have a rural district. I'm not a farmer. I didn't grow up on a farm, but I have a lot of farms in my district. And I really appreciate when I can pick up the phone and call people that I trust that I know that are going to give me good information. So um, it's important to have, you know, the ABCs of advocacy, be accurate, be brief and be creative. So, um, you know, I just I'll never forget, you know, the, the family showed up at the park and they had their dog and the boys were, you know, really great sharing with me, you know, how this bill would would help them and kids across the state. So I just, I, you got to keep it respective in this political climate, um, you know, and I would also recommend developing a relationship with your legislator before you actually need something so that when you do come to them with the need, they already know you as a reasonable, um, educated and uh, reliable source of good information. Let's see. Um, hi, I'm Rachel says I'm the president of Aisha. I just wanted to say one other thing about meeting with your legislators is that that information is available that you can find when you can meet your legislators in person. So in the Davenport area, we have legislative forums where many of our senators and representatives gather together and it's an opportunity to talk together both informally, but also formally during a question and answer period. And regardless of where you live in your state, your representatives and your senators all have meetings where you live. Like it's not mm -hmm. just that you have to go to Des Moines to meet with them. So throughout the year, they'll have opportunities informally and formally to mm -hmm. meet and talk. Thank you for bringing that up. Um, we do have legislative forums during the session. And I think you know, something that is that would be great for you to do is go to those forums. And then when you ask your question, you're not only, um, you know, you provide some background information for your question, but you're not only, you know, providing that information to the legislators, everybody in the crowd learns from your question as well. So you're kind of um, increasing the, you know, the 
the, the knowledge on it and a certain issue with the general public as well. Cause you know, not a lot of people know what's going on in your specific area. So when you ask that question, your education, you're educating everybody in the room on that topic, which I think is um, really good too. And, and again, just being very respectful and you know, you're and legislators also in the off season, we have fundraisers. Um, so, you know, or we'll have events, you know, show up and, um, you know, drop 10 bucks in the hat, you know, I, or a check actually, because then they have to write you a thank you note and actually write your name out and send you a note. But I'm, I mean, I, I have a guy that gives me 10 bucks a year and I write him a thank you note and, you know, 10 bucks might be all he can afford and bless his heart. I mean, I just love that guy. Um, because I know his name and I, you know, I'll tell everybody, this guy gives me 10 bucks a year and, you know, when he comes up to the Capitol, I'm happy to see him and I know who he is. And I just appreciate that, you know, he takes the time to scratch out a $10 check to me once a year. So, um, you know, it, it, it might be distasteful for you to do go do that. But um, again, it's it, it is another way to just make that contact with the legislator and just develop a relationship and let them know, you know, hey, I'm an expert in this field. If you ever have any questions, please consider me a subject matter expert. And here's my card. Thank you, Senator. Mm -hmm. I see there's a chat. Is that something I can see? Do lobbyists get feedback on why proposals did or did not get out of committees? Oh yeah. <laughs> well, first of all, I have to say your lobbyists, um, Matt and Kate do a wonderful job. Um, I think they have a very good reputation down here um, at the Capitol and um, I don't like all lobbyists, I'll, I'll be honest. I do, you know, reverse pivots and run down the back stairs to avoid certain lobbyists. And Matt and Kate are not on that list of people. So I trust them. Um, they give me good information and, uh, I, and I, I depend on them. You know, I, I think, you know, it's their job to give me, give legislators good information. So, um, and everything out around here is built on trust. And once they lose that trust, you know, it would be hard for them to represent any other clients. So you've got two of the best lobbyists down here representing your group. So um, they are very in touch on why things pass or don't pass or what the issues are um, and try to help us work through those issues. Um, you know, if there's a bill that goes through a subcommittee process and there's concerns brought up at the subcommittee, they'll, they'll work with us to try to address those concerns with an amendment um, to try to make the bill um, you know, try to address any unintended consequences or make it a better bill during the process. And, and then of course, you know, I'm over here in the Senate and it's their job to monitor the bills that go through the house so that we have some coordination through the Senate. We don't want to pass something here in the Senate. That's just going to go over there and die in the house and vice versa. So Matt, do you want to address that as well? Well, thank you for your kind words there too. Um, I see another chat in there, though, Chris, as time gets on here, maybe um, a couple of good questions there. Sure. Um, what made you decide to run for office? How did you do it? Resources you needed? Paperwork people. OK, well, like I, I mentioned at the beginning of the call, I was a school board member in Pleasant Valley before I was um, a state senator. And I, I have a degree in computer science and I have a, a website design business at home. and. Um, you know, I'm the mother of four children and, you know, I, I got my home based business so I could, you know, be available to my children and be involved in their lives. And I was just I never had any aspirations to run for political office. It was always very, um, you know, uh, distasteful to me, just politics in general. And uh, I was always probably, you know, an independent. Um, so I wasn't on one side or the other, but um, I would say that uh, I, I was involved in my kid's life. You know, I coached soccer. I was in the PTA. I was, you know, in the Friends of the Library and just really involved in my community and everything that involved my children. And um, as I got more involved in the PTA, I became PTA president, um, mostly because nobody else wanted it. And then I became PTA president at the junior high. And then Sandy Hook happened. Um, and I have four children. Um, my oldest is 24. He's in grad school at Iowa. And I have a daughter who's in grad school out at the University of Denver. But I have twin boys that are freshmen in high school. And they were in first grade when Sandy Hook happened. And that's the victims at Sandy Hook were first graders. And it really impacted me as a mom. Uh, it just it just hurt my heart. And at the time, the elementary school that my children went to um, on the north side of LeClaire was unlocked. And you could walk into the front door of the school and you were in the front office and there was no security whatsoever like we have today. And I, I had no idea who my school board member even was. And I called my school board member 
And I said, what are we doing to protect our kids at school? And he did not return my phone calls. He ignored my phone calls. He ignored my emails and mama bear got upset and um, started paying attention and started going to school board meetings. And um, one of my friends said, well, if you don't think he's doing a good job, why don't you run against him? And I was like, oh no, I can't do that. You know, I'm not a lawyer or whatever. And of course um, that was my call to action. And um, I said, you know what, put up or shut up. So I ran for school board and, and I annihilated him in the school board election. And uh, so, and I served a full term and then I became the president of the school board and I started advocating for public school issues with my legislators. I didn't even know who my legislators were when I got on the school board, but developed relationships with them to advocate for public schools. Then I started paying attention to other issues that were important to me as I got more engaged in the process. And um, when the opportunity came up to run for this seat, um, I kind of did it on, you know, I, it took some convincing because I really liked the nonpartisan aspect of being on the school board and being able to see, you know, the local impact of my decisions, but I was convinced that I could do more for education and more for other issues that are important to me in the Iowa Senate. And, you know, now I'm in charge of a $1 billion education budget. So that has certainly happened in just the four years that I've been here. So um, did not aspire to be in politics. Um, uh, I wouldn't recommend it for everybody, but um, I, I do appreciate the work and I do see that we are you know, having an impact. And we are, you know, despite what you hear in the news, not, uh, over 90% of the bills that we pass down here are bipartisan. Um, you know, we're not just down here fighting all the time. Um, we do agree on most things. And uh, um, I think we are making a difference here in Iowa. Um, I don't think that it's this way in most states, but I think that there are, an, you know, I think the, the we can't control what the news media does. They'll use, they, they have to sell papers and get people to click on things. So they, you know, put things out there that are clickbait. But I think most of us that are working kind of as moderates on both sides of the aisle are getting a lot of good, good stuff done for Iowans. How do I describe a lobbyist to your children? <laughs> well, I have to say when I came down here, I did not have a good, um, I did not have a good uh, uh, perspective or an, a good, I really didn't think much of lobbyists. I mean, you think, you know, there's a lot of money and there's a lot of, you know, they're just following the money and these lobbyists are just a bunch of sharks down here. So I wouldn't say that I had a positive um, view on lobbyists when I came up to the Capitol. So I've been very um, pessimistic, honestly, but um, you do learn who the ones you can trust are, um, the ones that are, you know, doing good work for their clients and provide you with the best information. So um, I tell my children, you know, lobbyists are down here representing um, you know, individuals or groups that cannot be at the Capitol, um, you know, all the time and keep track of, you know, every little bill that goes through the process. So, um, you know, I think that they're necessary down here to represent groups like yours um, to be on top of these bills that come through because sometimes they pop up really quick. You know, sometimes you'll have a bill drop and you'll have a subcommittee and a committee on the same day, um, which is not ideal, but it happens. And, um, you know, it's important that you have somebody representing the interest of your organization down here um, because there's no way that you could possibly keep track of it when you're doing your full-time job um, back home. So um, they're I, I, I think they're necessary, but all lobbyists are not built the same. I, there are some that I just absolutely despise. I'll be honest. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just being honest. <laughs> Um, let's see, with the new redistricting, if there were two legislators in the new district, how did do they decide which one remains? Is it through an election? Um, well, we've had a, it's unfortunate, but um, unfortunately with the redistricting, populations shift and um, sometimes you do get legislators that get put in the same district. And, um, you know, I can say over here in the Senate, in some cases, one has decided just to step aside and not run, um, you know, or retire. Um, and just let the other one go forward. Um, in some cases, we have a senator that's decided to run for the House seat that was open because there were two senators running for the same Senate seat, but the House seat became open with the redistricting. So they're gonna move over to the House side and run for that. Um, uh, you know, in my case, uh, I kind of lost part of LeClaire and then I picked up Jackson County and you know, I live, in, I live far enough away from every other legislator that it didn't impact me, but you know, in some cases, some of the House people are running for the Senate and vice versa, um, or there's a primary, unfortunately, they'll just have to primary each other and, the, you know, let the cream rise to the top and let the voters decide who's going to represent that district moving on. 
And unfortunately, that's just something that happens every 10 years. And as a legislator, you just have to know that's part of the game. So sometimes it requires an election and, and sometimes it just gets worked out independently. So, and sometimes it's done nicely and sometimes it's not done nicely. So <laughs> anyway, okay. That's all I see in this, in this uh, chat. But I, you know what I said, as long as we don't have any chat questions, um, I tell people all the time, if you've seen um, Schoolhouse Rock, I'm just a bill. Um, that was something that I watched growing up as a kid. It is freakishly accurate to this day. I mean, it really is how the process works. Somebody we just showed that to them. Uh, oh, uh, I we just that. We just showed that, yeah, about an, maybe a half hour ago, we just showed the video. I it is a great it. one, timeless. It, it, it's very, I mean, it's, it's timeless and it really is how the process works. You go to your legend and I think, you know, and I think I live on the border of Illinois and Iowa. I can actually, I live on the Mississippi River so I can see Illinois from my house. And I think, you know, just hearing from people you know, in the Quad Cities that, you know, work with legislators on both sides of the river. I think in Iowa, we are very accessible to our constituents. I do not think it's the case in other states. Um, so you can reach out to us and set up a coffee or, or you know, in the, in, come to our forums or reach out to us via email and, or call us. Um, I think we're very accessible in Iowa. At least, you know, I, well, I am, and I can speak for a lot of my, I'm sure some legislators aren't as accessible as others, but um, I think for the most part in Iowa, we're pretty accessible to our constituents. Um, I don't see any questions in the chat. I, I wanted to address a couple of the topics for discussion. Is, is that okay, Matt, if I just kind of go off what you gave me? Absolutely. You bet. Yeah, okay. I know um, there was the interstate licensure compact. Um, from what I can tell, there's a House bill and a Senate bill. It looks like that that um, that licensure compact has been put together on another bill involving occupational therapy. So I, it's working through the committee process. Correct. So that's still a live round. Um, the hearing aids for children. Uh, I'll just say that um, you know that came to my attention from a constituent, and then I know that someone reached out to Megan Jones, Representative Jones, up in Northwest Iowa. And so she and I got together and we had companion bills, which means we had the same bill in the Senate that we had in the, in the House. So we weren't competing with each other. Um, we wanted to make sure that we were aligned and working through that process together in the House and the Senate. Um, so that was, a, again, a great example of people from your field and, and families advocating at a grassroots level. It was fantastic subcommittee. We really learned a lot through the process. Um, and I know, I believe that what we're, you know, and, and again, you know, it'd be really easy to mandate, hey, insurance industry, you need to um, provide coverage for hearing aids for children under 18. Um, but the, easier said than done. And sometimes you have to take baby steps to get, make progress on these issues. And, um, you know, we are working with the in, in insurance industry, but we did learn through the subcommittee process that um, not all insurance coverages are the same. And, and even if we did mandate it, would, it would not apply to all insurances. So it wouldn't hurt, help all kids. So uh, one thing that I believe has come out of the subcommittee process that we've flushed out is that the state of Iowa uses a third party, third party system to manage the fund um, that is used to help offset the cost for parents on hearing aids. So we would save $30,000 if we didn't farm that out to a third party. So that's 30,000 more dollars that can be used to help parents pay for hearing aids for children. So that's one thing that we did to kind of make some progress in that area. But I think it's gonna take some work, you know, in understanding how the insurance industry makes these coverages and how it affects their rates and et cetera. But just because they don't do it now doesn't mean that we don't continue to have that conversation with them because you know, being, you know, a former school board member and, uh, you know, uh, part of the education budget chair, I know that if a student can't hear, they can't learn. And, you know, it affects their speech, it affects their learning. And if we don't take care of that early on and be proactive, it's going to affect them for the rest of their life. So, you know, I can't put a number on how much money that saves us, um, you know, throughout the lifetime of a, of a child. But I do know that we need to be very proactive and help um, these students on um, these you know, children uh, get those hearing aids and get the, 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 the devices that they need to be able to learn and be successful and reach their full potential. So that was something. And then um, the other topic of discussion I see 
um, has to do with special education services in schools. So a lot of these services are provided through the AEAs. Um, and, you know, I know through private um, individuals as well, but, you know, that's something that we're going to, you know, I, I understand uh, how important AEAs are to uh, providing these services to school districts that they couldn't possibly afford to, to provide on their own. Um, so making sure that, you know, they're, they're working well with the public and private schools um, across the state to be able to provide these services to our kids um, in their home school so they don't have to worry about transportation or making it to appointments. I understand how important that is. So, oh, I hear a dog. Who had the dog? <laughs> I love dogs, I'm sorry. <laughs> I think that there's another question. Oh, if, sure. If you have a proposed bill and you okay. don't know much about it, how do you get the information that you need? Well, we do. Um, if you know, in in this case, I would go to Matt and say, you know, what can you teach me about this bill? Um, it is is it is your lobbyist job to make sure that we have accurate information on the bills that come through. So, you know, I would lean on Matt and Kate to provide that information for us. Um, and uh, and, uh, you know, through the subcommittee process, um, you know, that is open to the public. Anyone can weigh in for or against a bill. Um, a lot of information can be found when you look at the, when a bill is filed, you'll have different organizations or individuals file, um, register in favor or opposed to the bill. And I always, that's kind of fascinating to me because it's always interesting, you know, um, who's in favor or against a, a certain bill. And when, when certain organizations or groups are against a certain bill, it makes me wonder why. Um, so I think a, an important job that, that your lobbyist has, um, you know, the, in terms of educating legislators is to educate us not on why this bill is important and all the pros of why we need to get it done, but they need to also address, you know, why are these people against this bill? And what do we need to do to address those concerns? So, you know, we want to be able to, uh, uh, you know, address concerns as they are raised through the process. And that, that would be your lobbyist job to inform us the, the, the who, who's for it, but who's against it and why are they against it? And what are we missing here? Because we want to make sure that we get all the information and create good policy at the end of the day. Because the worst thing that we can do is enact bad policy because it's a lot easier to take the time to really do the legwork on a bill um, through the process then have to go back and undo a bad bill. And, you know, and often, you know, it, it, uh, it usually, sometimes it'll take a bill two or three years to get through the process to really, you know, get good information and make sure that the bill does what it's supposed to do and doesn't have unintended consequences. So sometimes I call that the glacial pace of government, <laughs> which is just excruciatingly painful um, sometimes, but it's a necessary process where we're doing our due diligence. So, anything else? Last call, folks. Anything else? I, well, I have Stephanie. something actually. I see Stephanie. Okay. Yeah. Hi. Hi. Thank you. Thanks for being here, and thanks for your openness and honesty and um, your discussions. <laughs> Um, I just have a comment, I guess, and, and um, appreciate the um, where the hearing aid insurance coverage bill has come and gone. And, you know, the, the motion that it had this year was really exciting. Um, and I, I am thinking that money will be set aside through the early hearing detect early hearing detection and intervention funding. And we really appreciate that as audiologists and speech language pathologists for the families that we see. So um, the more money that can go into that fund, the better <laughs> and the more, yeah. the more kiddos we can serve. So I just wanted to say thank you for that work and um, um, process, so. Oh, well, thank you, Stephanie. And, you know, thank yous are always nice. Um, <laughs> and I, and I, I really appreciate, you know, there, there are more than um, a few options on how to resolve this issue. So, you know, it may not be everything that we want, you know, where we're getting, you know, insurance companies to do everything that we want them to do. Um, but certainly increasing that funding um, for parents to access is really important. So we're going to keep chipping away at this issue. It may not happen as quickly as you want to, but um, again, I call it the glacial pace of government, but sometimes it's not, it's necessary. So, um, 
Yeah, so thank you all. And I have a subcommittee that's waiting for this room, so I'm going to have to jump on here. So thank you, thank you Senator, you very much. I appreciate it. Yeah. Bye-bye. So hopefully everyone saw the message in the chat. We'd like to do a quick group photo of everyone that attended Advocacy Day today as we wrap up. So um, I'm going to have Emily switch us to a gallery view. And if we could just um, have everyone turn your camera on for a few minutes, we'll try and get the group photo that we would normally take on the Capitol steps um, as we're getting ready to go up and meet with our legislators. And um, thanks again to Matt and Kate for working with Senator Knoyer to have her join us today. Um, Hopefully next year we will be back up at the Capitol and getting to meet with her in person and getting to have all of our students and advocates meet with their own legislators um, back up at the Capitol. So, Emily, if you want to just give us the thumbs up that we're good to go. One second. Just take a couple here just in case. Thanks again. And while Emily's doing that, I'll just make one more quick announcement. Um, just a reminder for the ASHA CE uh, to make sure that your registration included your ASHA ID number if you would like us to submit that um, on your behalf to ASHA. So Sarah and Rachel, I'll turn it back over to you as we wrap up. If there's any follow-up questions or announcements that you want to make. Thank you everyone for joining us today. Yes, and if you're interested in finding out more about Aisha or advocacy, we'd love to have those conversations as well. And so part of us working to advocate for speech language pathologists and audiologists is hearing from you, what's going on in your workplaces with your clients. And so you can always reach out to Aisha um, or to me and we will help get your question answered if we don't know the answer and we are always there and available to you to help you. So thanks so much for coming today. Thanks everyone, thanks for joining us. We'll have this recording available and uh, please reach out to Aisha if you have any questions or follow up.